So, dear colleagues, we start our uh, seminar. Today is our guest, Professor Stefan Wüttke. He was born in, 2000, in um, 1980 in Gubin, Germany, and completed his diploma in chemistry in 2005 at the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin in cooperation with the University of Glasgow. He completed his PhD in 2009 with Professor Chemnitz at the, the same university, Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. For his postdoctoral research, he moved to the uh, Institute Lavoisier de Versailles and Laboratory Catalyse and uh, Spectrochemie, something like this. <laughs> yes. I think, yes. Supported by a Theodor Lyon grant. Since 2011, Stefan has been an independent leader of the research group, Wute Group for Science, hosted at the Institute of Physical Chemistry at the Center of Nanoscience at the University of Munich. Currently, he is an uh, Iker ba uh, Basque professor at the Basque Center for Materials, Applications, and Nanostructures. He research is focused on all aspects of internal and external surface engineering of porous hybrid bulk and nanomaterials, and in the exploration of the unexpected potential of materials beyond. To this end, his group are uh, developed methodologies to both read and write chemical information from and onto architecture backbone of hybrid, hybrid materials. At the same time, a basic understanding of the involved chemical and physical elementary processes in the synthesis and functionalization of these materials is pursued. So dear Stefan, please, you can start your presentation and lecture. Yes, thank you so much for this kind introduction and for this kind invitation. And I welcome everybody. And my presentation today have uh, one purpose and one purpose only to inspire you. I really wish like to inspire you with certain way of thinking that maybe helps you for your science. And as a, examples, we do, uh, speak about reticular nanoscience uh, and, and nanoscience in general. And as you know already, nanoscience is nothing new. It's, uh, um, Actually, it's going a bit down the excitement and I would like to analyze this behavior of field and I would like also to see what we understand from this and how certainly reticular nanoscience, where I will introduce you the chemistry today, how this can inspire this field and even advance this field. Um, first of all, let's go to nanoscience and what uh, started this uh, huge hype of nanoscience, because as you know, some of you 20, 30 years ago, there was a hype and researchers feel really empowered to do things that they could never do before. And this excitement was that just by structuring materials, for example, gold, gold, you know, the, you like to have one kilo gold, you know, the material properties and uh, the atom, but when you structure them to the nano level, they have new properties. And they, now I will take the pointer. They have, they have new property and they combine the properties from the atomic scale and the, uh, uh, me, uh, the macro scale. And this is very important. And with this, people, researcher was thinking that they could do uh, address certain social science uh, uh, challenges with it. But as usual in life, the excitement was very high, but the output so far not so high. And this is very dangerous and we need to understand this to learn from it. For example, this is a general hype cycle. You can draw this for each field. So we are actually, I would say here. So we had an, an trigger, the discovery, the understanding, especially with the um, uh, 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 electron microscopy, we could see at the nano scale, then many different nano classes were developed and then applied or tried to apply it for different kind of application, but researcher was not so able to transform the breakthrough science into technology. And the problem is, yes, that we're going down and we should do this, yes. We should take the knowledge and bring it here. And the thing is uh, um, that researcher tends, or humans tend to see always the advantage of things, especially when they are in this hype cycle, but not the disadvantage. But I think we researchers are responsible to see, first of all, the disadvantage, because this disadvantage of a field you need to encounter to address in order to advance it. 
And there are different intrinsic disadvantages. Uh, a nanoscience, for example, the thing is that it makes it so exciting. So the nano uh, 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 dimension. So nano is very small. You cannot very handle. And um, this makes it also very difficult to work with. Uh, to work with. So it's a double uh, uh, sharp uh, 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 sword. You know, you, you have two edges. One is very nice. One is very bad. And this is the problem. We need to understand this and uh, uh, um, acknowledge this in order to address this. And when you're speaking about nanoscience, you speak quite often about nanocarriers. It was what a huge hype, the Trojanic horse, and um, uh, you have a porous nanoparticle, and then you can fill it with the active agent. You can functionalize this nanoparticle, cap uh, uh, the drug, and then uh, put some ligands on it, for example, targeting uh, ligands, and then you can inject this in the human. And then due to the receptors, the nanoparticle finds specifically the cancer drug. It's uptaking and releasing the drug. And with this, you're improving therapy. And as we know, cancer is really, uh, uh, yes, it's making the, uh, uh, the way forward because we're getting uh, older and older, which we all like. But the problem is with every year in age, uh, the um, risk to suffer on cancer uh, increase exponential. And um, the thing is you have here an amazing concept and you will not find it in a uh, in, in, in clinic, uh, uh, in the clinic. So the medicine doctor or the cancer report, they're even not mentioning anymore this concept because there are a lot of research was done, but not successful. And uh, I want just to show us here, what is the problem? And the problems are really here, our, uh, um, not researcher, but researcher society, how are we thinking? Because researcher society thinks about publishing a lot uh, uh, of paper, writing a lot of grants and win this, but not addressing so much the issue. And uh, uh, when you're writing grants and when you're writing papers, you need always to show that you're very good and that you do very complex things. But the challenge here is, to synthesize something very complex in a very straightforward way. So actually you want to synthesize a multifunctional nanoparticle as simple as possible. And as Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate sophistication. So simplicity is, is the key, is the key to really address things and also to ensure that things will be later used uh, in industrial uh, setting and this mindset we need to change in researcher. And as you know better than me, the mindset to change of people is very difficult. And I was really puzzling a lot about this and think about this and how to do this. And, and as you know, people like numbers. We like in numbers, we, we like to put, we like to compare each other and how we can easily compare nanoparticles to put them in the number that a concept that maybe uh, consider this. And then uh, I was coming and really coming up the multi-efficiency concept. It's a extending of the atom economy concept, very simple, but very powerful. So imagine that you have four building blocks and then uh, let's imagine you have two functional units. And then we, uh, we synthesize the nanoparticle, put the drugs inside and let's imagine this is just one process step. So one reaction step. And now the idea is how we can evaluate this nanoparticle. I was really puzzling about this from the synthetic perspective, because the problem is with nanocarriers, if you once go to, to, to animal twice, this is very difficult and very expensive. It's increased exponentially the price with the animals test. And I wanted to find a concept and I established a concept um, that is based um, uh, a step before what, before you go to animals. So, I defined a functional ratio. This is very simple. The number of functional units divided by the number of building units. Basically this number tells you how functional your nanoparticle is. And then I defined the process efficiency, the number of functional units divided by the number of process step. Basically this tells you how efficient you synthesize an, uh, 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 a functional nanoparticle and both together is the multifunctional efficiency concept that you can find here below in this paper. And for me, this concept is very powerful because you can 
calculate easily for every nanoparticle. And if this value is low, you have to go back in the lab because if this value is low, you, you will never reach uh, um, real impact later. So there's no worth to, to kill cancer cells or animals uh, with this nanocarrier. You have to go back in the lab and uh, increase it. So, so the idea is for synthetic chemists. So I want really that they try to find very efficient ways uh, to synthesize a complex nanoparticle. And the question now is, um, is this possible? Is maybe a complex nanoparticle, is this possible? And there's always uh, good to look for mother nature. And uh, I think since COVID, we know that mother nature can synthesize highly efficient nanoparticles that can do multiple doing uh, tasks. And what we see, uh, with the eyes of a material uh, scientist is that nature always starts from the bottom up. Yeah, There's no other way for nature. Every materials around you, it starts from molecules, building units, and then uh, also nanoparticles, and then they make higher hierarchical materials. And I'm very fascinated by this. And we need to acknowledge that um, we humans cannot even close synthesize such a hierarchical structure. And at each length scales, we can functionalize uh, uh, the material and this is very unique and i would like to um, make such chemistry and first we need to for this to uh, synthesize nanoparticle and the chemistry that come a bit close to this approach what you see is is reticular nanoscience so reticular nanoscience they discovered by omar yagi 25 years ago is uh, you can synthesize building block units in perfection you know uh, um, you know that um, that organic chemistry, you know, you can also make perfect building blocks and here we can do this the same and we can take these building blocks and make porous materials out of this and then we can structure them to nanoparticle or higher structure. And this is very powerful. And uh, um, the materials that I'm very interested in is middle organic frameworks. So you can uh, 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 you can have either covalent organic framework or middle organic frameworks. Today I would like to speak about middle organic frameworks where you have middle clusters. So you have inorganic building block units and you have organic building blocks units that forms um, a structure, a crystalline periodic structure uh, uh, um, that are named. This this one is more five. Middle organic framework. So Omar Yagi, that was the discoverer of MOFs. He named it after MOFs, or other people named it other after their places. I can tell you later about this. But the interesting thing are the properties about these structures. So more than 100,000 structures are already reported in the Cambridge structural database. So you can synthesize the MOF with nearly every middle from the periodic table and take a, a huge number. Uh, amount of different organic linkers. And this is the reason why so many structure was published and are still publishing because yes, it's the number is nearly endless, I would say. So, and all these uh, structures have a high free volume. So they're low dense uh, materials. So they're very light and they have super high porosities. So MOFs are so far the materials with the highest porosity that uh, humankind have synthesized. So this is a quite good achievement. Then important, you can functionalize this material. This is very important. So you can functionalize it for different kind of application. And then you can even put different functional units in the periodic framework. That's called multifunctionality. And most of that will come later to this. It's very unique for this material class. And if you structure the materials, you can uh, have the microporosity. You can create mesoporosity and you can create uh, macroporosity. And all these properties you see, it's a very unique combination of many different uh, um, properties. And middle organic frameworks are also called designer materials because you have reticular design. And I would short explain what is reticular design. Reticular design is that you have building blocks, molecular building blocks, inorganic and organic in form of in this case, and you really can design these building blocks. And once you have designed them, you can form uh, a periodic structure uh, like this. So basically you 
take the position of molecules to the uh, material space. This is very important. And for example, if you increase the length of the linker, you can directly increase the pore diameter and the porosity of the MOFs. Another important thing is you can add this framework. So once you have the framework, you can even exchange the middle uh, and the linker with other middles or linkers because MOFs are formed with reversible bonds. And so this is possible. And importantly, you can functionalize the pore, you can make a certain pore environment. Uh, uh, either you put one functionality in one pore or two functionality in one pore or, which is very important, many different functionality in one pore. And this is very unique for MOFs that you have these multifunctional pore environments, which is quite interesting, for example, for Catals or for any kind of um, application where you want to tune the host gas chemistry. And um, as the field is already 25 years old, so uh, um, chemists have already to, uh, um, start to apply these materials. There are more than 27 companies synthesizing MOFs, so you can buy MOFs. And first company was the biggest company, uh, chemical company in the world, BSF. So they have start MOFs for gas vehicle. So you can you can buy this technology, but the problem was for them that now, you know, government all around the world, they like no e-cars, but not uh, gas vehicle cars. So, and there are many different kinds of other applications. Here you see Dude 60. This is um, a MOF from Stefan Kaskel Group in um, uh, Dresden University Technology. So this is the most porous materials so far and very important. Uh, um, this water harvesting application from Omayagi. So a dry region, you can harvest water during the night and you use the power of the sun to release this water. And this is very unique. You can tune the host gas interaction of MOFs like this, that it's enough to take water, but also give up because a lot of materials, they take a lot of water, but you need high energy to release it. And for MOFs, you can really tune this. And um, my idea, coming back uh, to nanoscience was that we have now uh, um, a material with high porosity uh, where we can tune the pore environment. And I would like to combine this with the nanoparticle world. So um, um, a material where the property is strongly depending on the external surface, combining it with a material that's strongly depending on the properties of the inner surface. And when you combine both worlds, I truly believe that we can make something very unique, a new a class of nanomaterials. Uh, for example, what are the advantages? You can use binding blocks that are in the bio binding blocks that are in the, in the human body, like porphyry, iron, and can make a, 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 a porous nanoparticle out of this. This is possible. Another thing, you have mild synthesis conditions. So recently we, um, established protocols for room temperature synthesis in water. So you can synthesize very easy the MOF structure and also the nanoparticles. Then we have this high inner surface area, which is good if you want to load something inside. Uh, uh, we can tune the host guest interaction because we can have this poor confinement chemistry. We have external surface functionalization. So in order to direct the nanoparticle in the body, for example, then we have crystallinity. This is very important crystallinity because it's ensure us with reproducibility. So a crystal, if we once control the um, crystallization uh, of the uh, material uh, and uh, we will have very reproducible results. And this is very important because um, a key challenge with nanoscience is to have reproducible results. And this is the problem with other material class, for example, porosilica, you not can tune so good the porosity. They are slightly different in each batch. And this is, yeah, this is not good if you want to go for biomedical applications. So I think MOFs have here really a key advantage. Then we can even add active building blocks. For example, I will show you iron MOFs are MRT active. So your nanoparticle is active already. And to be honest, my strong wish is to design a nanoparticle where every component is active in order to not waste anything. So we don't want waste. So if you make a nanoparticle, it needs to be 100% active. And we have biodegradability. So the MOF uh, um, will decompose, deassemble in the body over some hours or days or even seconds, depending on the MOFs. 
um, and this will be ensure if you use biocompatible building blocks that these building blocks are uh, 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 um, from taken from the body and then uh, discrete out. So this are a unique combination of many different advantages. Yes, and this is very unique. And this is why I decided our group to decided to synthesize to make smart nanomorphs, and we need to able to for this to synthesize um, uh, morph as the bulk materials. Then uh, we need to functionalize um, um, the scaffold of the morph. We need to synthesize colloidal, stable, monospheres morph nanoparticles, which is not that easy. Uh, then we need to specifically functionalize the external uh, surface area, and then we can uh, apply this morph, and in our case, for biomedical application. And these five points are now the outline for my talk, and I want to just give you the highlight of for each uh, point. And we starting with the uh, uh, um, bulk synthesis. So we synthesize the morph, and as I told you, we can also take active building blocks. And what we use uh, is anthracene. And the anthracene molecule is known for chemoluminescence, and we make this in a linker form of, and then we synthesize the morph, and we see this nice chemoluminescence. And the key is now that we have now a solid material. And uh, yes, I. No, okay. I cannot show you the video. Uh, hide. Oh, no. No, okay. Uh, so here's a video that's showing you the, the uh, uh, um, how the, the moth uh, is glooming here. And the key thing is that each of the linkers of the moths are now a lumifor, and they are periodic arranged. It is very important. If they would be not periodic arranged, you would see um, quenching. Uh, but in, instead, you see uh, materials that have high chemoluminescence and chemoluminescence you can measure very sensitive. So just one example how you can already with bulk synthesis make a functional morph. The second thing is the, um, um, the surface engineering. And um, you can synthesize the morph and then you can, with the synthesis, make these uh, 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 functional groups, for example, amino groups that you can use as an uncoring point for the post-synthetic modification of the framework. So you're using the framework like a molecule and make organic reaction to functionalize this. And this is going very good. And this is not uh, discovered by us. This was done by many groups and we had also published some work on this. But what is very important is that um, we have different functionality uh, uh, um, we can include to the MOF framework. So imagine now the framework this is the framework backbone. And along the backbone, like DNA, you can make different sequence of different functionality. So this is quite amazing and it's quite unique. So in these uh, uh, multifunctional MOFs, the MTV MOFs, this was discovered by um, Omayaki, and he could show synergetic effect. So he could show that if you put different functional groups inside, you have uh, a material that show a behavior that not the single one would show. And this is very unique. But the challenge uh, with, in general with material chemistry is always the characterization. You know, we synthesize a lot of materials, but to characterize them very well, this is a key challenge. And um, um, when you're doing, when you're working with nanoparticles, um, fluorescence uh, lifetime imaging uh, you use quite often. So fluorescence lifetime imaging is you just take an image like this and then you have from each pixel the fluorescence arrival time. So here it's high and here is low, the fluorescence lifetime. And the thing is with uh, students, also with me, uh, when I did my PhD, if I had a lot of data, I was very happy. But the problem here is you have a lot of data. Each pixel is a data point and this is really a challenge and you can make many pictures, how to analyze them. Uh, uh, and what we did, we used this uh, uh, phaser flim approach it's a poorly mathematical approach and taking all these values that are here in this image uh, in the Fourier space. So at each data point, uh, 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 here um, uh, each, uh, um, each point gives uh, a number in this plot and the color code reflecting how often um, this uh, um, photo arrival time occurs in this image. And the key importance is that you can give this a color code back. And then you see how different fluorescence lifetime are distributed over this image. And this is very helpful. 
And what we did or not what Omar Yagi did, so I asked Omar Yagi to collaborate with us and he synthesized a moth um, with two different uh, fluorescence dyes, Fitzy and Rhodamine. Uh, 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 and the, the idea was to use these functionality uh, basically as a weed out that we can study this uh, samples. So he did this and he synthesized uh, the moth. And first we, uh, uh, we incorporate uh, Fitzy and Rhodamine uh, separately. So just one functional unit, because you see already that this, they are already different uh, when, you increase, when you put Fitzy inside. So you have a good, uh, uh, um, increase uh, 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 in the concentration and for rhodamine it's not so high and uh, this is due to um, uh, different size and charges of these two dyes so this makes already a difference but for each dice if we incorporate and we saw always if we increase the content we uh, observed um, a decrease in fluorescence uh, lifetime so you see red is high fluorescence lifetime blue is low so and the question is what is it and the, there's two possible explanations. Either we have die-die interaction, then it's quenching, or we have die-moth uh, interaction. And the question is what it is. And uh, what we did now is we put the Fitzy concentration constant and increase the rhodamine concentration. And then we measure this. You see the two channels here. And we want to ex explain this. So this is the key question. How would these two functional units are distributed over the crystalline framework. If you have random distribution, order distribution, clustering, or if you have phase separation. And this is very important because Omar was in the beginning uh, uh, very criticized and said, ah, we have just phase separation. So basically physical uh, mixture of two phases. So in this we wanted to answer. Uh, first of all, what we did is the normal uh, bulk measurements, BET, XRD, SEM from these uh, five samples. And what we saw that there's basically no difference. So they, it's like copy and, uh, 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 and, and, uh, and paste. So there's no difference visible, but you see already here in this image, there's a difference. So uh, uh, what we did uh, then is um, we under, try to understand these images and can interpret it, them. So you see that if you increase the rhodamine concentration, you see a change uh, in the Fitzy channel. And this is, means that we cannot have phase separation because if there were phase separation, they would not have an influence. And this is very important. So we could very for sure say we don't have any phase separation of these two phases. So they're in, in one MOF structure. The next thing is Fitzy and Rhodamine was chosen by purpose because if they're very close together, we would observe uh, the Fred effect and we didn't observe this. So we have no clustering of the dye. And as these concentrations of the dyes are too low, uh, we are very sure that we have a random um, distribution of the two uh, dyes over the framework. And this is a, a very powerful statement. And I just wanted to, to show you how difficult, because I think you can easily grasp it was really a long study and uh, very intensive, uh, how difficult it is to um, understand really good materials, uh, complex behavior, but it's needed in order, yes, in order to design them later, because if we just constantly making new materials without deeply understanding, I think this is quite a bit dangerous. So the third point was the nanoparticle synthesis. So we have, now we know how to synthesize the bulk, we, we know how to engineer the surface, and now we must synthesize more nanoparticles. And for us, microfluidic and microwave is the best way how to syn synthesize more nanoparticles. We end up with very good monospheres uh, 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 size distribution depending on the structure because each structure behaves different. Uh, one uh, structure is very easy to synthesize more than other, others is very difficult. So it's depending, but microwave and microfluidic are the best method to go. But one very important point for me, again, characterization. Once we have uh, the nanoparticle batch, we want to characterize it. And here's a problem again in mindset of people because you know, when you ask always for the size of something, um, you assume that it's very easy. So, uh, because we can easily measure the size of objects, but we don't have the, a magic uh, uh, instrument that measure the size of a nanoparticle. And this we need to keep in mind, because what we have is 
different physical uh, methods that are based on different physical principles, and they even measure once it's in powder, once in, uh, in the liquid phase, so in different phases. So we need to keep in mind that we don't have only one size, we have always size distribution. So always please consider this. And all, when you measure the size of a nanoparticle or the size distribution, always consider the later purpose because if you if you make drug delivery, you need to measure them in solution. So I really recommend one of uh, our reviews where we speak about all this. So um, nanoparticle characterization is very important coupled with the later application. This you need to be considering. And once we have done this, now imagine we end up now with very beautiful porous here. You see the pos porosity, the crystallinity uh, of nanoparticles. And now, uh, 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 we can uh, uh, apply them. We could put the dyes uh, inside so we can uh, uh, study the uptake and release of the molecules. And we, uh, we did this. And what we observed is um, nothing uh, first exciting. So we can absorb a lot of dye molecules. So we have high loading uh, because the MOFs have high loading capacity. But what's interesting was that um, the release at different pH because in the blood we have 7.4 and in cancer cells we have a lower pH around 6 and 5 so we test this so uh, the um, release mechanism is very different and unfortunately not the way we want because uh, all the molecules that we tested are released at 7.4 which is in the blood which we don't want and uh, there's no release at lower pH but sure we can tune this uh, uh, um, with um, the pore confinement but uh, what I would like to uh, also introduce, maybe also to inspire you, as I said, is an, another method to characterize MOF nanoparticle that is done together with Thomas Bock. He developed this method uh, uh, and uh, still open for any kind of co collaboration if you have uh, interest. So he developed um, suspended micro uh, uh, resonator. So imagine a tuning fork that vibrates in a vacuum. And you know, here's a, a stream going this. And when a nanoparticle uh, uh, go, so the frequency uh, of the tuning fork change and he came in, measured very, very, very sensitive. So he, what he basically developed is a very sensitive scale. They can measure the weight of a nanoparticle in solution, which is unique. Uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, yes, this is very fancy and you can say, okay, uh, 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 we can do this, but what we came up, and this was really in a discussion, this was in Shanghai some years ago, he was discussing what we can do with this, and he said, okay, you can measure the nanoparticle, the weight in solution, but imagine now you change the density of solution, think about water, now you're adding a bit ethanol, so you uh, measure, uh, you're changing the uh, density of solution, and you can do this several times, and then you can plot this, and actually, when you're not anymore seeing the particle, it's meaning that the particle density is uh, equal to the density of the surrounding. So basically, you can now measuring particle density uh, um, in solution of these uh, uh, of these nanoparticles. Very unique, first time uh, that this was done, and uh, we did this then for uh, different nanoparticles. And now come MOFs in, into play because of the porosity. So we took. Uh, uh, MIL-101 chromium of MIL stands for Materials Institute of Lavoisier. So it was in France, in uh, Versailles, uh, uh, discovered. And we uh, functionalized uh, uh, this um, um, nanoparticle. Either we make it a bit more hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And then we measure the densities. And we see that depending on the inner surface, we have different densities. And then Thomas said, very good, because he's physics. This is very nice because meaning that in binaric solvents, so where you have uh, 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 where the density is depending on two different liquids, uh, porous nanoparticle violate Archimedes principle, and this is very important because Archimedes principle is really the principle for measuring density of objects, and uh, uh, porous nanoparticles violate this principle in binaric solvent, which is actually not surprising for us as a chemist because if you have uh, uh, inner surface area, which is either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, and then you have two different solvents, so it's clear that one solvent is going inside, but we could measure it and show it, and Thomas uh, could come up with this nice interpretation of these results. So this is very nice. 
And let's go in, uh, one step further and step uh, four. We want now to functionalize the external surface. So I showed you already, we can do this with lipid bilayer, but I uh, decided today to show you with the polymer. So we would like to functionalize uh, the surface with different functionality units, for example, receptors to find the tumor. And we would combine now uh, polymers um, uh, with a MOF. And the problem is MOF is porous, and we would just to functionalize the MOF at the external surface. So, and for this, we need to um, create new chemistry. And uh, this is what we did. So when you imagine a perfect uh, MOF single crystal, uh, uh, a single crystal is all, even if it's perfect, at the external surface, because the surface is by uh, a definition a defect, you have always defect sites. So at the external surface, you find either underconnected middle site or underconnected organic linker sites. And in our case, the, uh, if you look for underconnected organic linker sites, is uh, we could address them because they're only at the surface with uh, organic uh, 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 chemistry and specifically attached uh, a polymer at the external surface. And as MOFs are done by carboxylic linkers, so we have peptide coupling chemistry, it's very easy and very advanced. So we can functionalize um, uh, a MOF uh, with different polymers. We did uh, this with PEG certainly, this is the known map of this uh, oligo amino acid sequence done in Ulrich Lechelt and Ernst Wagner group. And we functionalized um, the MOF uh, with this. Uh, and this is very powerful concept, but Coming back to what I said in the beginning, simplicity, I would like to functionalize uh, the MOF uh, as easy and as best as possible. And there, uh, um, the other uh, underconnected sites are very interesting because underconnected middle sites are Lewis uh, acid. And then you can think, ah, Lewis acid, they like to uh, interact with Lewis base. And then the idea was if we attached at the Lewis base, the functionality, the functionality step would be self-assembly. So you're putting things together and they assemble by themselves. And uh, I love things. At first, it's very simple and uh, easy to do and also easily upscale. And there's no chemistry involved. You also, you just put things together and uh, it's done. And this is very powerful in terms of simplicity. So what we did is we didn't be uh, 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 synthesized, or this was by, done by Oli Lechelt lab, his text, because his texts are very known to, to attach uh, to um, underconnect middle site, three different MOFs, uh, MIL uh, 808, it's an iron 3 plus MOF, HCAST kappa 2 plus, zirconium uh, 4 plus MOF. And then we synthesized his text or unfunctionalized version. And you, uh, 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 and you see already the intensity is very low for the histex, so it's uptaken. Then we look at zeta potential, and you see here for the histex, always the zeta potential is very different. Then uh, uh, we wanted to know the amount depending on the uh, on the amount of histidine. So we have no histidine, uh, three or six, the, this is the histex. And we see with increasing the length uh, uh, um, of the histidine or the amount, uh, we have more uptake. And we see that different MOFs uh, um, have different uptakes uh, uh, um, of this. So also the amount of underconnected middle set are very different for MOFs. So this is very good. Um, but also what I told you in the beginning, advantages are very good. Self-assembly is a huge advantage. But what is the disadvantage? The disadvantage of uh, self-assembly is if something uh, assembled very easily, it can also easily disassemble. So the key question we have to ask ourselves is if this connection that we form is uh, uh, is good enough for our later application, and the application is later in the blood and later uh, in the cancer cell. And what we found is that the interaction is strong enough to, to stay in the blood, but uh, when the pH is lower, we have a risk because the, uh, the histidine are protonated, and this is very good, yes? So we have then a release. So we can add the functionality that will be later in the cancer cell released. And this is a very elegant uh, uh, concept. And uh, it's called, or the Lechelt called this, it called self-assembly multifunction coordination particles, ZEMCOPS. So, and this concept is very powerful because we can uh, easily attach different kinds of functionality per self-assembly. And we can also tune easily the amount uh, um, of the functionality at the external 
a surface just by increase by changing the amount from the starting composition and this you can be easily done uh, uh, um, and as I said simplicity so this is a concept where I think uh, uh, this is very powerful and you have a release even in the cancer cell so again only advantages but now let's come to the application because we were speaking uh, 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 a lot about uh, 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 what MOFs can theoretically do, but let's see if they can challenge the status quo. At first, where you can apply MOFs, you can uh, uh, apply for uh, diagnostic, you can make a, a, a um, drug delivery that dis uh, destroy the cancer cells, or you can make smart surfaces. But um, a question that I and every colleagues that deal with nanoparticles are asked is about the toxicity. So is are these particles toxic? And I really ask you to not ask me or everyone this so strongly because I don't like this question because um, when you're asking this question, you reveal that uh, the, I would say you're not understanding so much about nanotoxicity because nanotoxicity teach us that every nanoparticle formulation, so meaning with functionality, have to test for toxicity. And if a nanoparticle is very, uh, let's say totally untoxic, but it can, you change it a bit, it can be very toxic. So you cannot ask if moths are toxic or non-toxic. Uh, uh, also, there's different levels uh, where you can measure the toxicity and these levels. Also, if you want later to go inside the human, there's the human level, it's, it's very expensive and very long. And even for even big uh, nanoparticle tasks, this is not addressed for certain formulations. So this is a question not so good to ask, uh, more to ask, okay, what you intend with the nanoparticle and at what level you have done uh, these toxicity or later come side effects study. And we did this with, uh, uh, with different nanoparticle formulation. It was a huge uh, study that we did. Uh, you see here with different size of, of nanoparticles or we put lipid bilayer around and what we see then, we test them for different uh, primer effector cells. Primer effector cells are those cells, are healthy cells, that, for example, if you inject a, a nanoparticle in a the bloodstream, these cells will interact first before if you put them in the lung or in the skin or in the mouth or in, uh, in the stomach. So th th there are different ways how to 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 inhalate uh, to take in nanoparticle, and uh, uh, due to different uh, ways, there are different cells that interact with them uh, at first, and then different reactions. So when you see that each formulation had different response, yeah. This is very important, a very complex uh, topic, uh, um, as you see. And then let's see for uh, the cell uptake. So at first cellular level, so the ZEMCOPs, as I told you, we uh, assemble them with GFP. And you see here, each point is a, um, a MOF a nanoparticle with GFP. Uh, so uh, the cancer cells likes our MOF nanoparticles. And then we took them with uh, aperiodic uh, peptides and protein. Uh, um, equipped in the MOF, and if you put this stuff on cancer cells, nothing will happen because they are not uptaken by cancer cells. You know, and something that's not uptaken by cancer cells will not kill the cancer cells. But when you combine them with our MOFs, they are uptaken uh, and released, also very important, released in the cancer cells. So this is very good, but not very exciting. So uh, this is not challenging the status quo. So now, Let's come, let's come to this point where we would like to challenge the status quo. So we have amazing science, amazing chemistry, amazing design, uh, and we would like to use this to really make something very unique that no other nanoparticle class can do. And uh, uh, one thing uh, is, for example, uh, um, photosensitizer. Photosensitizers are developed uh, uh, since the 17th. At first, by organic uh, chemistry, really optimized. So then they were finished, and then the uh, uh, then different uh, with nanoparticles or with they was combined uh, with antibodies, and improved them. But the, the the fourth generation is that you, as I told you, that you take this photosensitizer and uh, make the nanoparticle out of this. And for MOF, is this possible? You so you can take these porphyrin uh, uh, linkers and make them. Uh, as a uh, uh, linker for the um, for the MOF structure. So then each uh, uh, organic linker in the MOF structure is a photosensitizer, and this is highly advantage. 
Um, and you see this no other nanoparticle class can go. And then you can functionize the nanoparticle. And here I really believe that you end up then with, uh, uh, and these uh, porphyrin morphs, this are also the one that I showed you that was three years tested already in humans. So this is something very unique where you really challenge status quo. Uh, the another thing is uh, uh, magnet resonance imaging. Huge field done, I don't know, thousand or hundred thousand times per day over the whole world. And what we did here is in collaboration with Michael Pender in the uh, hospital uh, in Munich, that uh, we compared, we synthesized iron moths. Iron moths are uh, uh, magnet resonance active. And we have here the contrast agent that are normally daily used in the clinicum. And when we combine them, we saw synergetic effect. So meaning that the combination is much higher if you uh, if you would just measure them as, uh, uh, separately. And this is, very, uh, this is a, a huge advantage because now you can have the same contrast, but with uh, much lower gadolinium concentration because nowadays they really want degrees and make this more sensitive. Uh, uh, and this is possible. And we, we study then this effect. So we study uh, size of the nanoparticle crystallinity, how the uh, uh, um, hydrodynamic radius of the nanoparticle in solution, how the, all this is affected make these plots and then you can really choose now the concentration that you want for intended purpose and really design a MOF nano particle where we have this inside and you can put other drugs inside or you can put targeting ligand and uh, with a much lower concentration uh, that you originally need. And this is again something that no other nano particle can do and there we uh, coming uh, um, closer to challenge the status quo. Another thing is that um, direction that is done with Jeffrey Binkerslag and why uh, lab in uh, south of China together is that saying that um, we have cells, different kinds of cells or organelles uh, that are optimized by nature over millions of years. And we cannot do it better, not in a uh, close time, but we have nanoparticles and we can functionalize them. And if we combine them together, yes, artificial bioaugmentation, so we can end up with something uh, uh, very good. We, uh, uh, and this artificial bioaugmentation, this we exploring currently. For example, we did also with red blood cells. We take them out, functionalize them, put them back, and uh, they are quite uh, stable. We can monitor them and we can add to the nanoparticle functionality. And the funny thing is, if you know Jeff, Jeffrey Brinker, this is the guy in uh, soul gear chemistry. So we're making silica. So, so we tried silica, iron oxide, with different things, quantum dots, but I can tell you that for MOFs, we don't know why uh, it works at best. So we can at best hybridize them with the uh, with the biomaterials. I think it's a bit this hybrid nature of MOFs, but at the end, we don't know. But for MOFs, it's really working by far better than for all other nanoparticle clusters. And uh, the last but uh, best sample is this killing cancer with non-toxic nanoparticles. So how we can kill something that is non-toxic? very important, always go to the basic, Paracelsius, the dose makes the poison. So every material is either toxic or non-toxic, the dose is just the key. And uh, uh, what we did is we synthesized um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, um, a moth um, with a lipid bilayer, and this uh, moth is uptaken uh, by the cancer cells and then it's decomposes, have no any drug inside. It's decomposed, and this uh, decomposition creates an osmotic pressure, and the cancer cells really exploding, uh, like in this nice Star Wars cover, you know. So the Death Star is really exploding, and uh, uh, with this we killing uh, cancer. And this effect is by far more pronounced for cancer cells than for healthy cells because. Cancer cells are there to eat, eat, eat. They don't want to uh, put things out, but healthy cells have this feedback mechanism. So if they see ah, the moth decomposed, then they, they can excrete the, this out. So this effect is by far much more pronounced for cancer cells than for healthy cells. So the idea is, uh, this is another key issue targeting. So targeting, uh, also targeting cancer cells with nanoparticles, it's not solved. And here we targeting cancer, uh, not by uh, uh, um, by targeting, but by uh, by the reaction. So for healthy cells, this effect is not there in certain concentrations. For cancer cells, it's just killed. And I imagine that this 
uh, uh, can be used for you know after the operation you put something on uh, 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 you put something on to just kill the rest of the cancer cells and even industry looking into this. Yes, and uh, uh, with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and uh, um, I hope I could inspire you from the moth world uh, uh, in general and to combine the moth world with the nanoparticle world. And um, yes, if you have uh, um, any question, so you can always uh, write me. I'm uh, I'm always looking for for new uh, ideas and collaboration partners. And collaboration partners are. The uh, um, yeah, the key word, you know, this kind of chemistry. I hope I mentioned uh, already several names. So this kind of chemistry you cannot do as one group. So I have a huge network of uh, collaboration partners, and I just would like to highlight some important. So first of all, the discovery of uh, of or uh, the pioneer of uh, middle organic frameworks, and I'm happy to saw that uh, uh, Valentin invite him also, and he will speak soon. So I. Strongly recommend to see the talk of Omar Yagi because he gives amazing talks. Uh, I want to thank him with Steve Boxer and uh, Javi in Stanford. We're making a project to mimic enzyme environments into MOFs. I didn't speak about them, but it's going very good. And I would like to thank them for their nice collaboration with Jeffrey Brinker and Vi. We did this artificial bio argumentation where we take nanoparticles and combine them. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, and uh, com uh, combine them with biomaterials. So it's a very good collaboration and I would like uh, also to thank them. Then uh, Tuan Lamas and Kim. So Tuan Lamas is a nanomedicine guy. So I hope to show you in the future more results from them, but you know, this um, this application of nanoparticles is really long and very costly process. Luckily Tuan is a very strong institute professor in Germany and have good money and we do very nice uh, stuff together. And so I think next year I can show you uh, 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 very important results about this because I will, Tuan, Tuan is really also a person that likes to apply things. So he's not about fundamental sense, I'm more fundamental sense. And so he wants really see them that they really can do something. It's very critical. And uh, with him, I think we can do something very nice. Uh, Johanna at the, uh, 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 university in Poznan in Poland. We have a very good uh, uh, collaboration. And then with Evelyn Plötz, this is a uh, characterization at uh, LMU. So she is a Raman influence uh, spectroscopy specialist. As I told you, we can synthesize a lot of materials, but here we can really understand them. It's very important. Then Harald Gröger in Germany. Uh, with him, we encapsulate enzymes into the MOF so to stabilize the enzymes and uh, make them uh, uh, apply them. Then with Oli Lechelt, I showed you the same COPS idea. This is from Oli Lechelt in University of Vienna. Then Romy Ettlinger, we start to synthesize some new biomorphs. Then Giamin is a very recent collaboration, but very strong. So, you know, the, the next uh, level, uh, you remember the slides, I showed you that nature created hierarchical materials. So actually I try now to make such hierarchical chemistry and with Giamin, we try to order nanoparticles specifically and connect them to make a certain hierarchy. And this is going very good. Then I would like to highlight a very strong collaboration with uh, Mohamed Ahmed and Farad in UBC in Canada. So these are engineers. And uh, what we're doing there is engineering uh, MOFs and make really macroscopic materials because you need this for application and it's very good. And then I would like to thank Roberto. This is a young researcher and BBC materials, independent young researcher, and we're working together and helping each other out. So this is very good. And uh, certainly I would like to deeply, deeply thank my group because I have a fantastic group. I have pleasure to work really with a lot of enthusiastic young scientists that share for me the craziness of certain ideas and really also be eager to pursue them because as you know it's uh, science is not uh, very easy and can be very frustrating yes and we we working very hard but as you see we have also fun yes we have uh, 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 different kinds of uh, fun uh, uh, and uh, really helping each other out and i really like the atmosphere in our group but also in our center and last but not least Certainly, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Ed, I would like to use this occasion to announce. So uh, um, uh, I am in the process to organize an European chemistry postdoctoral school for Ukrainians that will be uh, from May to July every two weeks, uh, uh, one lecture. So you will hear a certain uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Valentina will send uh, the information. So in there, we will invite different researchers of Europe that will speak about the institution and about the science and the ideas that just to giving you the possibilities to come in contact uh, uh, with them and hear about uh, their science. And you will have at the end, if you attend all this, you will have a certificate uh, that you attend this. And we just organizing uh, uh, the, the paperwork with the Ukrainian Chemist Society that they will agree to this. But I think uh, uh, this will be done very soon. So again, thank you very much. And uh, I'm open for any kind of question. Thank you very much, Stefan, for a very interesting uh, lecture. I obtain a lot of novel information about morphs and uh, combination of morphs nanoparticles. And by the way, you answered practically all my questions that I had during your lecture. It's very important. So, and you're right, Omar, yeah, he will be the next speaker on our seminar. It will be uh, second the March. Okay, dear colleagues, do you have questions to our speaker concerning his really very interesting lecture. Uh, hello, may I have a question? Yeah, okay. Nikolai? Uh, hello, you spoke about the nanoparticles that uh, um, breaks uh, explode, as you said, the cancer cell. But it is not that if the cancer cell is uh, disrupted such a way, the growth factors are going to the blood and uh, uh, mobilize mobile um, cells to grow. And this creates metastasis. So how do you think is it a good way to um, investigate this process that from the beginning may have some problems? Uh, uh Yes, you you highlight now the, the the challenge, but I can highlight the advantage. So at the end, I cannot answer you. And also with the people that you spoke, if the advantage is, you know, always you have advantage, disadvantage. And if the advantage are higher than the disadvantage, it's uh, 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 um, so this we cannot say, yes. But um, uh, 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 the, uh, also this assessment, I cannot give you. But it's, what is key here is that this is a very different concept. And you know, I'm fundamental sciences. For me, it's at first that you have really new mindset that you kill the that you take the the the, the moth itself uh, because there's no drug inside. And uh, with Tuan Lamas, we want also explore this more that we use moth structures and make different effects uh, about this. Because if you're making these na nano carriers with different functionalization step, is uh, is too complex. Yeah. But yes, to answer your question, no, I cannot. We cannot tell you now uh, uh, if the disadvantages are higher than advantages. So this is the honest answer. Okay, is the way to check it. I understand. And the next question is: There, you spoke about your most unfavorable, unfavorable question about toxicity. Yes. <laughs> but you, I'm sure after this, you will uh, address with these questions all the time uh, that I'm sure you are prepared. So the question is that about the toxicity, not of the final nanoparticles, but of the parts of these particles when they degrade, for instance, and give some uh, some starting material into body, if they are toxic or not, if they are safe enough. Yes, you know, the problem is that it's very easy to ask questions, but it's so complex to answer. So also for, just to understand for, for you, for example, uh, uh, people uh, people make now uh, some uh, middle morph, for example, calcium morphs or just things. And you say, ah, uh, this middle is non-toxic, but this middle occurs in the body, but in certain part. So when you speak about toxicity, you need always to say, okay, uh, if I put now uh, some ions, if I put them in the mouth, or in the cancer cell, or in cells, or in the stomach, in the blood, or where else. The toxicity is very different, very different. And this is why it's so complex to answer this. So uh, 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 so you cannot give, uh, uh, so for example, I can tell you also biocompatible uh, 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 building blocks, for example, iron moths. And then I uh, took a fumaric acid, which is also in the, in the blood. And then, for example, my friend uh, uh, Twan, he said, yeah, it's, it's very good, but at the end it's okay, but still we need to test it and see for the specific application you can. And the problem with toxicity, you can never give a general answer. 
<laughs> so and if okay, I speak about... I understand about, what you mean. This, this you, is, you have to always do the special studies it, in each case. Understand. Yes, yes, yes. And and what I what I don't like uh, sometimes, you know, uh, um, with this question is, uh, uh, I had this in the beginning when I start with MOF nanoparticles, which says, ah, yes, toxicity. Uh, but uh, uh, um, these questions are sometimes mean to just put, I, I like to inspire people, you know, like you and not, and toxicity, sure we have toxicity, but now I'm more looking for unique concepts that no other uh, nanoparticle uh, class can do. And then I will bother a bit more about certain toxicity. Sure, I, I measure uh, 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 at cellular level toxicity, but this is most of the time, no problem. So uh, to tackle toxicity, really, I want at first to understand. So we make enough with one biodistribution in, in, inside mice. So it's, uh, I just said, it's really take time and at certain level uh, uh, to answer this. But um, I know at the level I want to, so my uh, uh, objective, my aim is to find unique concepts, unique concept and at first inspire people and then uh, bother too much about um, toxicity or certain application or scaling up. Uh, uh, people also like us, how we can scale up the stuff, yes. But uh, I I believe we should at first do look in uh, novel ideas and no, that that change the, the, the mindset. And Omar uh, Yagi, that will have the next talk, he's one of the best person with the most creative mind that really make innovative concept that really changing the mindset of people. And as we agree all this we want, I want at first to there to to inspire people and then don't worry i will make my work but it takes ages these 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 i don't like you know when you're with biomatids with uh, already at cellular level but also with mice my god it takes time and and and, and money yeah uh, it's uh and it's uh easy to ask but hard to address but yes but we, we okay, were may I have another Please. question valentin yeah of course Sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is about this photodynamic therapy that you propose to use very complex, uh, some kind of uh, uh, photosensitizer together with math and something else. Uh, can you explain again benefits of such a complex uh, solution or suggestion? You mean the photosensitizer? Yeah, first. Uh, yes, yes. First, uh, uh, sorry, correct, it's not complex. This is the idea. It's very simple. So you have an iron sword and you take, you, you synthesize a photosensitizer that you have also, you have this and you have characterized and then you can assemble a moth out of this. So you have a porous nanoparticle where 80% of the weight is the photosensitizer so, uh, in, a, in a very defined porous con uh, uh, core uh, environment. And you can you have a porous nanoparticle that is already the photosensitizer, and uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, this is the key. Yeah, before you have you take the photosensitizer, put it in porosity. This other people did, but now I'm building the the, the the nanoparticle out of the photosensitizer, and no other na nanoparticle class can do this. And this is the advantage, and it's done very simple. This is why sorry, correct. This is this is not complex. It's very simple. Uh, yes, you it's one process step, and then you can put even additional stuff in into the porosity. You can functionize the nanoparticle. But this concept really inspire me, and I hope to inspire other people. And as I said, you remember the slides where I spoke about application. So this was wait one second. Can I find it now? Six. Wait, I think no. Uh, no, then was eight. No, it was. Yes, here. Sorry. So here, this this two dollars, this is a photosensitizer moth that was in injected in humans. I so mean, why you cannot inject just to photosensitizer? Why do you need moth there? Yeah, to improve the therapy. So you can you can you, ah, you so can it's yeah, yeah, sure. It's, also, always always to improve the therapy. Sure, you can uh, can also use, but it's it was to optimizing uh, uh, the, the effect. So you can attach things. You can insert this certain combination here uh, is, is 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 secret. Uh, 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 what they did uh, like that, yes, yes. But you you have the you have the nano effect now. You have not any more molecule. You have an uh, uh, a, a nanoparticle with porosity where you can tune the external surface functionization, you just can do more. Ah, okay. This is the, just another way how to use this. And uh, now yes. you cannot say anything about benefits yet. 
Yes. Okay. So the benefits is you have the benefit of the nanoparticle, but how to explore it? No, this I cannot. How they okay, did Okay, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much for your very nice nano lecture, which is really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai. Okay. Other questions, dear colleagues? Yes, thank you for your uh, very beautiful uh, presentation. And I have a few questions. Uh, first of one, uh, you use term high tunability when characterized MOF. Could you explain more about this term? What do you mean high tunability? This energy tunability, electron tunability, all this you talk about material tunability. What, what is it? Yes, uh, 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 tunability, it's also design. This is basically on this slide, the reticular design. So you have a morpho porous structure and you uh, 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 um, that you can tune now the structure like you want. So this is the community speak about this. So you can tune uh, 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 either the inorganic building block or organic building block. And with this, the porosity, and you can tune the inner, uh, the inner surface uh, uh, Function. This is very unique, you know, for other material classes, nanomaterial classes, you cannot do this. And this, this, this you win when you combine uh, reticular design with uh, with the with the nanoscience world. And this I want later to explore. So this uh, I meant with it. I understand. Uh, and as a, uh, enough important, maybe close to biotoxicity, this one uh, degradation of this material. Uh, you talk about uh, that some of structure can decompose in specific conditions. So this material dependent to uh, strength of this uh, material dependent to uh, st uh, strength uh, bond between linker and middle block all these one strengths of uh, linker. Where is decomposed this uh, uh, material? Uh, linker, also uh, the inorganic and organic building block. This is the weak link that, uh, because it's coordination bonds, sure, and then you have molecules that dissolve. So this is the weak link, not the, the, the organic molecule. There, there is also there, there's also a, 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 a recently nanoparticle with where the organic linker uh, has cyber sulfur bond, so that it's that destroying this inside uh, uh, the the cancer people designed it, but uh, um, it's um, uh, it's the uh, uh, organic uh, uh, middle oxo uh, cluster bonds that is uh, deassembling. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for a question. Okay, maybe somebody else. You have another possibility to ask. So I didn't see him. Okay, Stefan. So thank you again for your very, very nice lecture. And uh, I hope we will meet with you on the conferences or maybe we will visit Ukraine. Uh, yes, as, as, sure. as possible. Yes, don't forget all this. So I will send yeah, yeah, you uh, so later this. Yes, and I thank you also again. And yes, I also highly advise Umar's lecture next time. Uh, it will be cool. Yes, yeah, thank you. And uh, if somebody of you have any questions or such things, just drop me a mail. This is always welcome. Okay. Oh, have a nice day. And you too. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And stay all safe, please. Thank bye. you very much. Thank you and bye bye.